Hey guys, I'm very proud to announce Brian Noyce, all the way from the USA. He's a best-selling author, and I've spoken with him at many industry events, uh, tech eds all around the world. He's going to be talking tonight on Windows Workflow, and he's going to be doing an interactive demo with it. So with that, I welcome Brian Noyce. Okay, welcome, and so the first talk, like we said, is going to be uh, Workflow 4.0. Um, it's somewhat unfortunate timing to try and do this uh, because, as you, uh, you know, probably already know and heard there, uh, 2010 Beta 2 came out effectively yesterday, uh, Australia time. I frantically downloaded it last night, got it installed early this morning uh, because basically the workflow stuff substantially changed between Beta 1 and Beta 2. So that means none of my prior, uh, prior demos, none of the pre-built SDK demos that they ship with Beta 1 work and they haven't shipped any new ones for beta 2, so I don't even have any that you know are Microsoft provided. So in terms of demos, uh, it's going to be fairly simple, kind of draggy droppy, do it in front of your eyes, keep it simple. We don't have a lot of time for each topic anyway, so that's probably good enough. Um, but you should get a, a good sense in, in going through this about what Workflow 4.0 is all about, how it's different from Workflow 3, and uh, what are some of the key features. Please do interrupt me anytime. I like these to be interactive, so if you've got questions, get my attention and let's talk about it. Uh, quick background, like Adam said, from the States, uh, fellow RD from the what's called the Mid-Atlantic region, that's basically Washington, D.C. and the surrounding states. Uh, do a lot of writing and speaking. Oh yeah, also Microsoft MVP. Uh, probably the only important stuff here is my contact info at the bottom. Like I said, feel free to ask questions throughout, but if you want to ping me by email, uh, hit my blog. I only blog a few decent articles a month maybe, um, but you can hit me there as well. And if you're a Twitter person, I occasionally turn that, turn that stupid time waster on, and I'm Brian Noyes on there, just all strung together. So what, you know, why, why do we need a new workflow? Well, if anyone's work, used Workflow 3, you know why you need a new workflow. Uh, workflow 3 had good intentions. It did a fairly good job. It had lots and lots of pain points. Uh, I like to describe using Workflow 3.0 as death by paper cuts, because it's lots of small little pain points uh, that you have uh, throughout the use of it. And there's lots of kind of gaping holes and scenarios that are just way too hard. Uh, the idea behind workflow is that you get to work at a higher level of abstraction. You think about your overall business process and pictures and diagrams, uh, and those, those business processes typically need to be long-running, stateful interactions, not just little discrete chunks of business, business logic that you want to automate. If it's just little discrete pieces of business logic, workflow is not the right technology for it. But if it's kind of a long-running workflow, do a little bit of work, wait for some input from a human or an external event, something like that, do some more stuff, and you want a good scalable architecture where you can kind of draw that out and the drawing becomes the code, uh, and then you can uh, really see what's going on from the drawing as you evolve the code. You know, some new regulation comes along, you add a step in your process, you have to collect some new information, you know, store it in a particular way. You have a very uh, graphical way of going in and seeing that stuff. So at a high level, very quickly, that's sort of the value proposition of workflow. But in using uh, Windows Workflow, in uh, 3x, that, which you know includes the original release in 3.0 plus the current release in 3.5, there was very little change between those two. These are just some of the things that, that were not so great, and and the list is certainly longer than this. But these were some of the primary complaints against Workflow 3 that uh, people complained against. You know, the people want to use it as a rules engine. Sometimes the rules capability was pretty uh, pretty lame. Um, data flow was really one of the hardest parts. It, it wasn't particularly hard, it was just ugly. The way you had to basically pass data from one activity to another, the building blocks of a workflow, by, by the way, are called an activity if you haven't ever touched it. Uh, that's basically a bubble on an act, on a activity diagram, if you think of it in terms of diagram terms. Um, the way you had to flow data from one activity to another was kind of messy. You always had to basically kind of write it to the code behind of the workflow and then pull it back in. So you're basically working with semi-global variables across the entire workflow. Uh, so they kind of fixed that. There were, uh, in terms of extending the base activity library and writing your own custom activities, the, the model was kind of hard. And the built-in activities were, uh, you know, basically really simple control constructs is all that was there. So these are all things they're trying to address in 4.0. So there are major themes here. One is to go more declarative. Everything is about XAML these days. It's not just WPF. Uh, 
So now, uh, you know, W uh, Workflow had XAML-based workflows in Workflow 3, but you always had code behind associated with that workflow. And you were kind of forced to have code behind because of the programming model I just mentioned, that you had to stuff a lot of things in the code behind to get anything meaningful done. In Workflow 4, basically the workflow <laughs> is just kind of a diagram, and it's woven together with XAML that uh, describes the hierarchical nature of this activity goes to this activity, goes to this one, and so on. So if you hate XAML, you'll probably hate Workflow 4.0 because you have to live a lot with it. The good news is, and they particularly structured it this way in the designer, you should never have to touch the XAML directly. The XAML is there for the tools, not for you. But if you really love XAML, you can dive down in there and actually write your uh, workflows as XAML if you want. Um, base Activity Library, they add a number of new activities there. I'll show you once we get into the demos. Simplifying custom activities, I mentioned that. The programming model is much, much better there. The base classes that you have to choose from are easier to derive from. Put your custom code in. Uh, the, they had a fairly complicated model with the, with the old uh, framework of the way you handled child activities and decided which child activity ran at what time for composite activities. That's gotten a lot easier. Dataflow, they now have a very uh, uh, easy construct of variables and arguments uh, that models much more closely what we're used to writing in, in just normal code. Runtime improvements, you know, one of the biggest changes about Windows Workflow, and you know, Adam alluded to it, that how many people, let me see your hands again, how many people are actually using Workflow today? It was like one or two. Okay, so very few. Uh, you know, for the people who are using Workflow today, the bad news is, you know, if you want to take advantage of anything that's in Workflow 4, you have to start over because almost everything changes about Workflow 4. And part of it is this fact here. It's a whole new runtime engine. So you can't just take your you know, existing 3.5 workflows and activities and so on and run them in 4. You have to rewrite them to a large degree. The good news is the whole 3.5 stack is there. So anything that was written before just runs in 4.0 as it always did. But to do porting and slowly move over to 4.0, you have to do a fair amount of work. Since most people aren't, uh, here aren't using it, I won't focus too much on those aspects. Um, Designer is another big one. You know, one of the uh, supposed value propositions of workflow as a technology is the idea that you get a business analyst, non-technical, non-programmers, uh, give them a tool where they can just kind of draw workflows themselves, set some properties, and now you have a new chunk of executable code that sat you know, satisfies some business use case. In Workflow 3, theoretically, it supported that, but you had to do a, a ton of work, uh, kind of pre-build applications, and, and there was re-hosting of the designer in, in 3.5, but it was you know, at least 200 to 300 lines of code just to get it hosted and presented in an application. In Workflow 4, it's basically one line of XAML or one line of code to take the designer that's in Visual Studio and plug it into your own app. And then like one more line of code to put a toolbox in there with some activities, and it inherently supports drag and drop. And it's all WPF based, so you can style it and do fancy things with it if you want to. Um, and from a user perspective, a programmer user perspective, the designer itself, because it's all rewritten in WPF, Theoretically, it's a better user experience. Uh, I'm not fully convinced of that yet based on use of the betas, partly because they're betas and they're not quite there yet. But it's kind of like moving the problems around to a certain degree. The big thing to keep in mind, and Adam alluded to this as well, even though it's called Workflow 4.0, think of it as Workflow 1, you know, redone. Uh, so it's started over, whole new approach to workflow, you know, same basic underlying requirements, but with any version one, there's going to be a, a whole new set, uh, set of, you know, warts and ugly aspects that you run into as you use it. So will it be perfect? No. Does it address the major problems with three? Yes. Um, is it worth adopting? Depends on your scenarios, and we can talk a little bit more about that. Other things that have changed, I said new activities in the base activity library. Uh, there are some new control constructs beyond what was there before. You know, they had the basic <coughs> constructs of if, while, things like you would put in code. Uh, the parallels here, they had a concept of a parallel activity before, but workflows before were really single threaded. And they had the appearance of concurrent work, but it was really that if this branch of a workflow is waiting for input, it's blocked on something, 
Uh, it could jump over to another branch of a parallel and execute on the single thread and then jump back. And it kind of jumped around and gave the appearance of concurrency, but only on one thread at a time. With uh, Workflow 4, you get true concurrency. You can write your own custom concurrent activities that basically go off on background threads, do some asynchronous work, join back into the workflow at the point where they uh, are complete with what they're doing. So that's kind of a big addition as well. And that's pretty straightforward to use in terms of the programming model underneath to write your own custom activities that do that. Um, collections, one of the main things you often do <clears throat> excuse me, in a, in a workflow is manipulate collections of data, iterate through them, execute you know, little sub-workflows sub based on each item in the thing. So they have some primitives that let you deal with that directly in the workflow. Um, other things, uh, assignment is another one that it, it goes hand in hand with the data management aspects. You know, a very common thing to do would be go get some data from a service or from a database, some source of data that you pull it into your workflow, and you need to assign it to some other activity or thing that you're doing in the workflow. And before, you pretty much had to drop to code behind to do that. Now they just have a primitive there for doing assignments. So I won't go through all of them there. You get the idea. You know, kind of missing gaps on just basic primitive operations they've added. Theoretically, they might add additional ones. They have said that they're going to try to be more agile with this, and over time, they will build new activities, kind of like the WPF and Silverlight teams have done, put them out on CodePlex, you know, put them in a basically a semi-release state, not a formally part of the framework yet, but kind of done, baked out on CodePlex that you can pull down and use over time. So expect this list to grow. Uh, one of the big additions, and also one of the most ugly pain points for those who are using workflow, which luckily is a small set in here, is that uh, in past workflow, one of the hardest things that lots of things you would like to implement as a workflow, you would go to a whiteboard and you kind of draw it up, and you typically draw it as like an UML activity diagram. This happens, then this happens, we branch over here sometimes, then this, then this, then this. And there's an inherently sequential nature to most uh, you know, real world workflows. But inevitably, in most real world workflows, there's a part where you get to this step, and based on some condition, you gotta go back up here and do something again. Uh, the only way to do that in uh, workflow three was in a sequential workflow as one of the top level workflow types, you could put a while loop. And so if you had something like, say you wanted to implement a wizard in, in uh, a sequential workflow, you basically had to have while loop nested in while loop nested in while loop because every, every step in the chain you wanted to be able to go previous, previous, previous. So it's kind of ugly to try and do that. One of the things they uh, did here to try and address that is a new workflow type called the flowchart where you just have free form activities you put on a palette, and then you basically draw between them, drag and drop, I'll show you in the demos, uh, to connect the dots and say, I go from here to here, here to here, here to here, back up to here, uh, whatever kind of directed graph you want for the flow within your workflows. The downside to that that I mentioned for those that actually adopted workflow was the other workaround besides the ugly nested <coughs> while loops was it sort of forced you to the other kind of workflow in workflow three was a state machine workflow. And there's also lots of natural uh, scenarios where you wanted to, to pick things as a state machine. Well, for some unknown reason, I guess just scope management, they decided to just chop the state machine workflow. Probably 90% of real world workflows on workflow three are state machines, so why don't we chop that? Um, no idea what the reasoning uh, you know, behind that was but that's where we're at in terms of what is projected here for release. Because they are getting beat up severely about this, you know, I would expect maybe a CodePlex kind of uh, solution out there based on the new activity programming model to try and address that somewhat. But for you know, what, the, what is planned shipping in version four, you basically have a sequential workflow still, which is still useful in a, a limited set of scenarios, but probably now you'll build all your stuff as flowcharts because that's your only other option. And then maybe they'll chop that in workflow five for us. Um, so other things it does, easier programming model, easier hosting. Uh, one thing that was definitely lacking in workflow three was uh, unit testing. You could kind of unit test activities themselves when you wrote custom activities, but unit testing the workflow as a whole was uh, very hard to do. Now the workflow as a whole is just an activity, and it's got an easier programming model for invoking it. So it's, uh, it's quite easy to unit test both your activities and your entire workflow now. Um, Let's see, what else? Custom activities, I already said that. The workflow bookmarks it's referring to is kind of a lower level programming model that you hopefully don't have to touch too much, but it's actually easier than the uh, 301 that was uh, corresponding. Now, some of these slides are already stale. I gave this talk uh, about a month ago at a user group in the States. Uh, you know, looking at the code after I pulled it down, 
one of the things that has changed big time between beta one and beta two is a major refactoring, renaming. And so workflow element, I believe, is no longer called element. I believe it's called activity. That's the base class. And this one has become something else. But uh, you know what these were intended is you have one core base class for all activities that you implement, now called activity. Not sure what this one is called. But this one was for basically composite activities where you're, you are a parent and you have multiple children. Code activity is still there as a derived one. You can write, you know, just if you have just a simple uh, chunk of uh, executable logic you need to put in your, your workflow. Maybe you need to go write some data access, pull some stuff out of the database, do some computation based on some algorithms that you have, something like that. You know, it's basically going to be C sharp at that point. You're not going to draw that out in the workflow designer. But code activity makes it very easy. You just have an execute method that you put your logic into, a uh, simple method for passing parameters in, getting parameters out of it, and hooking those up to other things that are going on in the workflow. And that's your code activity. And then the native activity is for that kind of low level bookmark based programming model for advanced scenarios. Yes? It's a quick thing that workflow model today. Uh, they actually post it up with diagrams of that. Oh, excellent. The activity, activity with the other ones as well, but it's actually quite a generic activity. Okay. Um, but they've got some really good slides and they should list all the changes between B1 and B2 and everything they've broken, essentially. Excellent. Based, based on feedback. See, if I hadn't been teaching class all day, maybe I would have found that. Where is that again? Uh, it's on the blogs at nsdn.com slash the workflow. Okay, so the workflow so team blog. Team, the person, excellent. Team good. Hopefully, they'll also get some demos out soon, or the samples out soon as well. Um, I mentioned the data flow aspects are you know, a lot better. Uh, I'll show this here in a demo pretty soon. But basically, what they broke it down to is these concepts of arguments, variables, and expressions. Arguments, just like uh, you know, your methods that you write in code, before there was uh, a mechanism where the only way you got data into your <coughs> activities was through data binding mechanisms. Uh, and it was kind of, like I said, you always had to go out to something external, some external scope, which was usually your workflow itself, where you expose properties. Arguments let you kind of explicitly declare on the activity itself, just like you would on a method. These are my in arguments. These are my out arguments. And they're a uh, generic uh, type that you kind of wrap the real type. You do like in argument of integer, in ar argument of string, out argument of GUID, let's say. And uh, you have a strongly typed programming model around that. Variables, just like in code, you can have local variables. You can have scope variables with curly braces in C sharp or the equivalent uh, whatever in VB. Um, this is the same construct in your workflow, where basically container elements, such as a sequence that has some child elements, becomes a scoping container, where you can declare some variables at sequence level. You can define them at the workflow level for everything to use, down at an individual activity level if it has children. So it gives you a nice, clean scoping mechanism for kind of flowing the data around. And then you can easily bind the variables that are in scope within a part of the workflow to the in arguments and out arguments of an activity. And then expressions down here is basically the underpinnings of, I mentioned the, the rules capability of workflow before was not so great. Expressions are just like a statement in code, basically. In fact, they are a statement in code. Uh, and the, the somewhat surprising part of this is, guess what language they're in? VB. So they picked the VB engine, uh, and there was a lot of debate in the insiders group about this uh, when they made this choice. They picked that mainly because they already had the runtime uh, syn syntactical checking engine that they basically have. You know, runtime, or I'm sorry, VB, when you're typing in the, uh, in the editor, is basically doing a runtime compilation and checking of the VB that C Sharp does not do. So you get slightly more robust. Uh, correctness checking than you do with C Sharp with our red underlines and stuff. Just to poll, how many of you use VB as your primary language? OK. So um, so I'll try to keep keep down the VB jokes. Um, <laughs> but basically, this they chose VB uh, because they could get it in there quicker. It's based on a provider model. So theoretically, you could write your own you know Ruby language and plug it in everywhere you type in your expressions in the designer and elsewhere. Uh, or whatever language you want to support there. But the one that ships out of the box right now is VB Expressions. So us bigoted C Sharp guys, we've got to learn some more VB. So is, is it using the same one they use in reporting services? Uh, I can't answer that, because I don't know what that one is. Are they just directly using the, the VB engine one that, that the code editor yeah, uses? So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that that's part of the reason they did it. There was kind of like you know already implementations within Microsoft of how to rehost that thing. 
Uh, other areas of improvement, workflow and WCF integration. Now this one, you know, I do tons of WCF. I've done a lot of workflow. The previous workflow WCF integration that came in with 3.5 was not great. Uh, some of the things in the new and improved approach I like even less. Uh, and I'll show you what some of those are in the demos here. So let's finally do some kind of demo here. I'm going to fire up Visual Studio 2010 and wait for it. Wait for it. Here it comes. Come on. I think it's waiting. Oh, there we go. Look at that. Non-rectangular UI. If that's not a compelling feature to buy a whole new version of Visual Studio, I don't know what is. But it is symptomatic of the fact that, you know, if you're not aware, the entire UI of Visual Studio has been rewritten. It's a, a one big WPF app now. Um, so, you know, if there's any doubting people out there that are like holding off on WPF adoption because you're afraid they're going to throw all their eggs in Silverlight and make WPF go away, they didn't just spend three years rewriting Visual Studio's UI to abandon the technology. WPF's not going anywhere. Okay, so, um, you know, Adam was also alluding to the fact that some things are already being rebuilt on Workflow 4, and Workflow 4, even in Beta 2, is kind of only part, part way there. It was virtually unusable in Beta 1. Uh, in Beta 2, it's more usable. We'll give it that. Uh, there's, you know, lots of things about the final experience that are still missing. If you go to the project types here, uh, you've got, you know, project types to create a console app like before custom libraries and stuff. Um, what is sort of missing here is you'll see once I get into a project type. So let me just create one of these workflow project types. I'll just leave the default naming there. Um, basically, the structure here of a workflow app in the new version, you still have a program.cs that gets things going as a, as a console in this case. Or you, know, you could put this in a Windows app, a WPF app, Windows Forms app, ASP.NET app, Windows Service, wherever you want to put it, it can run. So you got to have some startup code for whatever kind of process that is. But from there, like I mentioned in the slides, it's pure XAML for the workflow definition itself. Now, some of the things that are kind of lacking here, you go and say add new item, or you know, first you go add, and it looks an awful lot like it thinks it's a Windows Forms app, uh, application. And in fact, even if you say add new item um, and go to workflow, the only thing it really lets you add is an activity or a workflow service. There's no chance to add another workflow in here for some reason. Uh, you could do it manually, create the XAML, <coughs> XAML file by hand and pop it in there and then it'll recognize it, but kind of odd that they don't let you add anything except the initial workflow. Um, toolbox here, you'll see one other aspect of uh, Visual Studio kind of show up there. It wasn't as noticeable this time. Uh, the first time you bring up the toolbox for a given designer, there's some hesitation there, and things magically pop in there. It's because in Visual Studio 2010 as a whole, there's a whole new extensibility model there based on the managed extensibility framework. And the workflow designer, the WPF designer, all those have been rewritten on top of that new ex uh, extensibility model. Okay, in terms of activities, you can see there's a whole bunch of categories here. Uh, to keep it simple here for start, we can drag out something like an if activity and put it out there. And maybe inside of the then and else branches of the if, we'll do a primitive right line for demo purposes. And you can see there's just you know drag and drop uh, kind of experience here. And you can see these statements in here, enter a VB expression. So one of the changes to the designer here is more in-place editing on your activities. For 3.0, it was drag and drop a colored little blob, select the blob, and then do everything else in the, in the properties window. What they have tried, tried to do, and this is where the experience is still, they're working out the user experience on this, is trying to pick out you know, what are the primary properties you have to set on that thing for it to actually work correctly, and giving you a decent editing experience for those uh, in situ in the designer. The conditions here, you know, say I want to hard code a true, uh, you start typing, you can see you do get IntelliSense because it is doing dynamic parsing of whatever you're typing. Uh, and you can see it's uppercase true because it is VB instead of C, C sharp. Uh, and they have common versus all uh, kind of trims down the IntelliSense based on the context of what you're doing. The one thing that's a little squirrely here is text. You'd be able, you'd think you could just do something like that. Is that a legal expression in VB? No. Okay, so if I want that to be my text, I have to surround it in quotes. 
to make it a legal statement. So some of these things, hopefully they'll get a little you know, smarts to it to say, if the property I'm setting is a text property, don't make me make, you know, write VB code to make it legal text. Do some wrapping for me and turn it into a string for me, or to string it at least. Um, so we'll just put in you know, some other text over here so we can discriminate which block we went down. Obviously, if it's hard coded to true, we should go down this block. Uh, we can change it to false and see that it switches if you care. But that's the basic kind of programming in WPF you're looking for. Drag an activity, set some properties on it. And that's the part where I said, based on that programming model, you know, theoretically, you could hand this over to business analysts if there is such a, you know, a, a template for what a true business analyst looks like. You could give it to a business analyst. They could drag and drop some domain-specific activities onto a diagram. Someone has to build those domain-specific <laughs> activities first, and that would be you, the programmers. Uh, but they could theori theoretically drag and drop those, set some properties, and have a meaningful workflow. You know, what's an example of doing that? Well, there's of the people who said they're already doing workflow, let me ask it this way. How many people are doing workflow not in SharePoint? Zero hands. Okay. I give talks at you know, tech ed and conferences and stuff that are focused on workflow. Obviously, the people who come to those talks are generally people who are very interested in workflow already using it. When I ask those questions at, at, at an audience like that, how many people are using workflow? You know, maybe 80% of the hands go up. I ask it, how many people are using workflow not in SharePoint? You know, maybe one or two hands go up. Uh, the vast majority of use of workflow 3.0 is in SharePoint. Why is that? Because it's the only domain where there really is a, a palette of domain-specific activities pre-written. To write a meaningful SharePoint workflow, mostly it's drag and drops and pre-built activities that have to do with managing lists, sending notifications, doing document approvals. Those are all pre-built for you in SharePoint. So you can basically just drag and drop them, hook them up, maybe put some custom uh, you know, rules for when things get invoked in there, and you're off and running with a meaningful workflow. That's really the direction workflow is trying to go uh, to a large sense. And this gets us a lot, uh, lot closer there, both with the ease of rehosting this designer and a toolbox of activities, um, and in terms of just the experience in, in editing things and hooking them up. Uh, Brian, we also get it in Serum 4, pretty similar. I'm sorry? We also get the same thing in Serum 4. In what product? In CRM. Oh, CRM, OK. CRM 4 is the next version coming out? No, it's the current one. Oh, current one? Yeah. OK. So they, uh, CRM and SharePoint 2007 are both built on Workflow, workflow 3. Are they moving to Workflow 4 in the SharePoint 2010? As far as I know, yes. Now, I mean, there, there are also a bunch of other products that have shipped on Workflow 3. There's Speech Server. Um, as far as shipping products, I'm not sure what else is out there. Um, those two definitely, CRM, SharePoint two, 2007. There's a couple others I've heard, and I'm, I'm drawing a blank on them. TFS uh, build? That's on the next version, right? No, 2010, which is... Yeah, that would be based on Workflow 4. Yeah. Yeah, so coming things, you know, uh, they've talked about, I'm not sure exactly when this will come in, but they've talked about SQL integration services. You know, basically you're drawing workflows of what happens when. Uh, they're going to rip out what they're doing now and replace it with workflow. Next major version of BizTalk, rip out the orchestration engine, replace it with workflow. So there's a lot of up and coming things that are going to be are in the process of rebuilding on top of this as well. Right. Yes. I'm just struggling to hear Adam's question. Would you mind oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm terrible about repeating this. So Adam was basically just asking about shipping. What, what other products are being based on workflow, both the current version and the upcoming workflow 4 version? OK, um, so that's the basic experience there. Drag, drop, uh, you know, hook up some properties. Some of them you can hook up in the designer here. You can see, obviously, there's additional properties in the properties window here. Some of those will bring up, uh, you know, if you do have a big complicated expression you need to type, you're not going to be able to edit it very nice in the tiny little text box there in the designer. So any of those, you can click the, the dots there and get a, a bigger text writer that you can resize. Is there any sense? Is there IntelliSense? Yes. Uh, as I showed you there, when I start typing, um, you know, in the case of the strings down there, there's not IntelliSense because it knows it's trying to match it to a, a text property. Um, so it's just kind of taking what you put. But you know, in here, you could start typing if, you know, uh, and you can see full-blown IntelliSense in there, just like you're in the code editor in VB. OK. Um, so if I ran that thing, uh, let me go drop into the program. .cs and show you how do you run it. 
that's one thing that's got a whole lot easier. In 3.5, you had to spin up this runtime, create the workflow, tell it to start. Uh, if you just want to just kick off a workflow and call it basically like a chunk of your reusable code, they've got this thing called the Workflow Invoker. One line of code, point to the instance of your workflow, and it goes and runs. And then to keep the uh, console app alive here so we can see the output, I'll just do a console right line read line and run it with F5. And we should see it come up. It was hard coded to true, so we should see that left branch, which was some form of random characters or not. Uh, you need to quote the second. Oh, did I, I didn't quote the second. Thank you. Nice cryptic error there to tell me that. All right. Thank you. You can see it is giving you validation in the designer if I had paid attention to that. Basically validates at each individual activity level and cascades that up until uh, you know the lower level activities are happy with their input and will respond to my mouse clicks. Um, the outer activities will also complain because their inner activities are complaining. All right, am I still debugging? Yes. Why is there no compile time? Uh, good question. Validation errors, that is an excellent question. Validation errors in 3.5 did cause a compile time error. Not sure on that. Sometimes, it, well, in 3.5, sometimes it was an extra pain point because their validation wasn't that good, and sometimes it would complain about things that weren't really a plot problem and wouldn't let you get past it. So they might have backed off for that reason until they could get the validation straightened out. But if this time it works, there we go. We have that left key that started with L and it gets output to the window. Not a spectacular demo, but more to show you the kind of the programming experience here. Other things you can do here that I was talking about the workflow services. Let me show you what we got there. Sorry. Yes. Can we have a look at the Xamarin file? I'm curious about Oh, absolutely. I'm curious about what happened if you try to merge this thing. I know some people are working on the same Xamarin file and try to do a merge. OK, so the question was, you know, can we see the Xamarin file? Well, first thing you, know, you might think is to go, so where is the XAML tab? You know, we're actually authoring XAML here, like WPF. Sometimes there might be power situations. I want to drop down to that and just edit it. Uh, they're trying to keep you away from it to a large degree. So you actually have to go close this editor and go say open with the XML editor. Um, so they're sort of trying to force themselves to make it good enough in the editor, unlike the WPF one where you have to spend most of your time in the XAML. So you can see it's basically just a hierarchical um, kind of structure here. We've got the containing activity. We have the outer if with the two branches, an if.then and an if.else, which are sort of mandatory child activities. You can drop the else. And then it basically just, if the if is not true, it just bypasses the activity and continues on. Uh, inside of those, we had right line activities. So we get an element for each one of those. And then just like XAML and WPF, each property on the actual uh, element or on the activity itself just becomes a XML attribute that you set. So it basically becomes the nested aspect of the activities in the designer just becomes the hierarchy of the XAML that you author. So to the degree that, you know, your other question there had to do with source control and merging, you know, to the degree that you can merge XAML and WPF, you should be able to, you know, merge your XAML here in, in uh, workflow as well. I'm sorry, let's finish over here. Is there a reason why you embed both content and design information in the same file? Like this was discussed in, in some other places, like the, the, the XSD designer thinks like the position of the content that's designer specific should not be part of the XML, that's, that's content specific. You're talking about the hint sizes here? Yeah, like yeah. that part. Like somebody opens the file, moves a, a relevant one pixel, and it's modified, which actually is not content modified. Um, so the question is, you know, why is the positioning, sizing, designer rendering aspects of the of the design experience intermixed and mingled with the you know functional code that the XAML represents? Can't really answer it because I didn't write the designer, but I, I know what you're getting at. With some of the other technologies we have in the designer, they put that out in a separate file and associate it with the elements. That would seem like a cleaner design to me. Um, can't really answer why they didn't choose to do that. Uh, over here. File reference, oh, file name here. Um, excellent question. 
another one of those I can't really answer. Why does that need to be there? Uh, XAML or XML reader it's re reading for or <coughs> referring to here. There is some degree of debug experience if you're working with the XAML directly, and it might be related to that, but off the top of my head, I can't really answer that. Again, ideally, you don't drop down here in the XAML, so that's all just you know, up to the tool to write whatever it wants, but your uh, concerns from a source control perspective are certainly valid that from a source control perspective, you don't, to some degree, you don't care what it looks like, you just care how it functions, but everyone should see the same, you know, really one of the main benefits of the workflow is the rendered design of your code. So that it certainly is an important aspect from a source control perspective, but interweaving it with the functional aspects, I agree, is not a very clean approach to it. Well, yeah, so the comment is, you know, some people may work around that by writing their own way of, of just, uh, generating this stuff. Definitely, you know, the XAML itself, and you can also write up this whole thing. It's really just a nested object model as well under the covers once it parses the XAML. So programmatically, you can create a whole workflow and a few lines of code, you know, a simple workflow, obviously, and you basically just say whatever your root activity is, and it has an activities uh, child collection, and you add child elements in, or child activities into that by constructing them. So you can actually use the property initializers, collection initializers in C Sharp to just put it all in one big nested uh, chunk of C Sharp as well, or obviously do it more in line with calling add and so forth. So some people may just favor that because they find you know what the designer generates to be not useful in the end. Okay, uh, so back to creating a uh, Workflow that is workflow services. Let me go ahead and create a new project here. Just to separate it from this one. And they do have project types for this. So for speed purposes here, I'm going to leverage that. We'll create a uh, WCF workflow application here. And you'll see what you get here. It's, it's very similar to what we had in workflow 3.5. Just broken up a little bit more. And with a few features that apparently the uh, the team thinks our enhancements and I absolutely hate as a, as a service programmer. Specifically, what they generate here in the, in the uh, default project is like if you create a WCF service library today or a workflow service library today, they pre-populate it with a simple service already implemented for you so you can hit F5 and run and just kind of get a quick experience. Downside to that is every subsequent one you create, you got to go delete that stuff out and clean it up to start working on your own real project. But it works great for demos to my benefit here. So basically what you get is your workflow itself, if you're familiar with WCF services, think about the workflow class itself as the service implementation class. So it's just the place where you hang endpoints off of and service operations off of. And certainly intermixed with those service operations, uh, you can have any degree of business logic intervening that's just implemented as activities uh, between the service calls. So what this uh, pre-built one represents is it's got a container here. So the workflow itself is the first level of container. Uh, the second, and it's just of type activity if you look under the covers, the base class. This uh, sequential service here is really just a sequence activity, which again is also a container that says I do this, then this, then this, then this in a, in a sequential fashion. Um, each one of the individual activities, oh, the other thing I wanted to emphasize is they have a hierarchical navigation model here. So depending on what the child activity is, let me put something else in here that's more complicated. Um, perhaps a whole flowchart that I put in between the incoming service call and then the outgoing response call. And you can see it says double click to view. So you can double click on that and the designer kind of swaps out, drills down, gives you a you know blown up <coughs> view of that individual activity with its own design palette. And in here, I could you know, drag and drop some other activities. And this is the experience I said of you connect the dots and say I go from start to here. And then you can't go back to start. Um, but you could basically just terminate at the completion of the right line. There is no explicit stop uh, thing that you put out there. It's just whatever the last activity in the sequence in completes the uh, workflow. Um, or you could branch out to something else. Uh, so let's set ourselves up for a nice. Uh, infinite loop here, let's drag and drop from here to here, from here back to here, uh, good, it won't let us do that, 
Uh, in some cases, it will. If I put an if branch out there, it'll let me set up a nice infinite loop. So you do have to be careful with that. But you see this navigation with breadcrumbs up at the top to drill back out to the sequential service that calls out to that. Um, I'm going to delete that off so it doesn't screw up the running of this. But basically, one of the things they did here in 4.0 compared to 3.5 is they broke up. In 3.5, we had a receive activity that represented both the incoming call and the outgoing response. Sometimes you want to do some work in between that. So in 3.5, you had to put nested activities in there. It was kind of a constrained model. Here, they just broke them up and said, ultimately, you know, at a service programming model, messages come in, messages go out. They're not necessarily tightly coupled to one another. So they have a separate send response uh, that you do have to uh, tie in with an incoming uh, request. And you do that with this property on here that they hide from you called the correlation handle in the previous version. Oh, good, they did hide it from us. So before, you had to explicitly hook up the correlation handle between an re uh, incoming re request and an outgoing response. It looks like they got smart about that and buried it for us. Uh, programmatically, you can get to it, or there's other things here that correlates with and correlates on. Uh, it's still hiding here under the covers, but before you had to explicitly hook it up. Um, so basically this little blob here, the receive request, is basically your endpoint that you're sticking out to the world and saying you can call into this workflow at this point. Because we expect this, in this case, to kick off our workflow, uh, you do have to set a property somewhere down here called can create instance equals true, or check the box in the new designer. And that says this can kick off the workflow. Service message comes in, gets routed, says, OK, this is for a given workflow type. That workflow is not running yet. Kick off an instance, route the message to this particular activity in the workflow, and then it moves on from there. Then you can go do some work, like I said, in between. Come up with whatever you want to send back as a response. And you basically bind whatever data structure you want as a response into this request object. This one is uh, kind of pre-built here. The receive request, I think, is just empty. And if you spin this thing up, it's also got like service libraries. It should have. Let's see if they actually did it. Um, in your debug, where did debug go? They don't have debug anymore. Well, let's spin it up and see if it does what I'm expecting, which is should fire up the uh, WCF service host as a place to live, okay, or the ASP.NET development server, so it's web hosted. And does it spin up a client for us? <coughs> Looks like not. So there is this thing called the WCF test client uh, that you can fire up. It's part of the Visual Studio and can call out to these services. But clicking on the XAMLX page here is basically going to give you a service page just like it's a WCF service. For these workflow services, the way to think about it is the fact that you're doing it as workflow, that's just an implementation detail. From a service programming perspective, you know what's inside your service boundary is up to you. The outside world shouldn't know or care about it. Um, so this is just a way to get your services implemented if you choose to do so. Yes? Is there any good support for unit testing these workflows? Like what if I get something like code coverage, auto -reach? I'd like to, for example, we have a policy in the project to have 80% of the project at least. How can I guarantee that I get 80% of the project to put all the units on the Okay, so the question is, you know, how, how good of support is there here for unit testing of these workflow services? Uh, if you want to get a particular target of code coverage, how do you make sure you get that? Even though this thing is just this declarative XAMLX file, and they uh, you know, just used a name, new, new file extension there to distinguish these from WPF files, um, ultimately this thing manifests itself as a root activity. Uh, just like any other activity, and it's got an execute method on it. So from a unit testing perspective, and it's got potentially in arguments and out arguments that you can declare on it as well. So from a unit testing perspective, you just create an instance of it, um, which you can, once this thing's compiled, it's just a compiled type in the assembly as far as any other external assemblies uh, consider or concerned. So you could write your unit test assembly that sets a reference to this, creates an instance of uh, service one, Calls execute on it with parameters, get response back. Yeah, but if it doesn't call, uh, cover code call, which how do I know, like, with the current, if, if I would write the same if statement in code, I could get out of the, the code call which of the unit test. It's okay, I actually covered every branch. Ah, I see where you're going with that. 
Um, Especially for something like this, to be very critical for me to prove that every branch of that design was hit with the input that I put in. Otherwise, I could put 5 million inputs and only hit 5% of the I see where we're going. So, so the, the further comment there is because things like if clauses, your conditional branches and things that are typically the things you care about for code coverage, because those are just declarations in XAML, how do you know whether you actually hit them from a code coverage perspective? Don't have a good answer to that other than, um, you know, don't have a good answer. They don't amount to lines of code that you have direct control over. Uh, that you can get, as far as I know, you don't get any code coverage statistics off of the, the declar declarative parts. Same problem exists for WPF, and that's why in WPF you, you know, use separated presentation patterns like we'll talk about later on to try and have your logic code separate. Um, here, really the logic code you're, you're normally, the, the core logic code you definitely want to test is in the activities, and those are definitely easy to test. It's still easy to test the workflow as a whole because it is an activity like I was describing, but code coverage would be a problem to, to say exactly what you got there. Yes? Um, and what about transactions for security? You get all that WCF that says things for free here? Um, so good question. The question was what about WCF or what about transactions and security if you're exposing yourself as a workflow service? Uh, that was one of the things that was lacking in 3.0. It's on a later slide, but then we'll just talk about it now. In workflow 3.0, uh, you did have a transactional activity that you could wrap things in to start a transaction and do transactional work in the workflow. But, and even if you put a you know, service, uh, service receive activity in there and had a transaction flow into you from an external service, you always got a new transaction in 3.0. Here in Workflow 4, they do support flowing transactions into the workflow. The workflow joins in you know, as, a, as a, you know, a nested part of that transaction. And in terms of security, they do support a, a wider range of bindings and things for doing uh, authentication and authorization against the service. Now, I mentioned there's one thing I don't like about this new model. If you look here in the, uh, in the designer at your workflow definition, this receive request, as I said before, represents an external, externally facing endpoint, basically, or a operation on a endpoint. So where is the definition of the service contract? If you're used to WCF programming, you're used to declaring explicitly a service contract as an interface, decorating it with some attributes, and a nice explicit model of this is what my service boundary looks like in code. What does your service boundary look like here? You basically have to find your way around the workflow, identify each of the activities that represents an external operation, and then look at that thing for the operation name and the service contract. So what they're actually doing here is your service contract definition is scattered around in the XML behind this thing, and basically a service contract is sort of on the fly determined by the aggregation of all the defined service operations within the workflow. Don't like that one bit. Most people I talk to who have done services don't like that one bit. Hopefully pressure from the community will get them to sort of fix that by release. Is there um, some sort of wisdom you can get back from it? Uh, yes, so certainly from an external perspective, this thing is just a service. And you can enable metadata through your, uh, your config file just like you do with WCF services. And from an external perspective, you can find out exactly, exactly what is exposed. But from a code, code maintenance perspective, show me the one-stop shop I can go in here to say, this is everything that's on my service boundary. You know, you, you don't have it, basically. And I don't like that one bit. OK, um, so that's a quick thing on service. Workflow services. Let's go back to slides real quick because I got to finish up here and take a break and move on to the next topic. Um, We've still got 15 minutes on this topic. Okay. Um, the XAML authoring, again, they see this as a plus. They advertise this isn't this great. We just embed all the contract information in your XAML. Uh, I don't see that as a feature myself. Add service reference. Uh, let me see if I can demo that real quick. That's pretty slick. So first, let me make sure this thing's still happy. I didn't corrupt it. Let me run. Why won't it run? Because I'm already running. Let me just do this. If it was already running, it's happy. Let me add a new project. We'll just make it a normal console app as a client. Um, so because it's just a service, actually, I don't need to demo this part. Just like any other service, I could just go do add service reference to it in a normal project. The part that's kind of slick here is if I add a new project that is a workflow, 
and we'll just make it another workflow console app. And from this workflow console app, I want to go talk to this other workflow that is a service or just some service out in the wild that has nothing to do with .NET or workflow. I go and say add service reference to this. And basically what they'll do is generate on the fly some custom activities for me, send activities that are able to call out to other workflows. So basically behind the scenes here, completed successfully, thank you very much. Um, hiding behind the service reference, and they should show up in our toolbox if we're lucky. Uh, let me build. Okay, and here is a get data custom activity that I can just drag out on the consuming client workflow to consume some service. It's already prepackaged. It knows what that operation is. It declares in and out arguments for that activity for the parameters and return values that are on that service operation. It's basically pre-built you know, custom activity to put in there. And then you can customize that activity as needed uh, by you know, partial classes and or dropping down to the code that they generated. So that's kind of slick because before consuming services and, and workflows, they had one pre-built send activity that was very limited in terms of any kind of customization on it. And you basically had to do a bunch of hookup on it to get it ready to, to call the service. So I do, definitely do like that feature. Does that toolbox show every operation that's exposed there? If you had more than just get that? Yeah, so definitely if they're, they will generate an individual activity for each individual uh, operation. Ryan, is that all services, not just workplace services? Yeah, that, this is just, it's really just going out through metadata exchange or uh, WSDL at that point and pulling down the metadata and, metadata and doing code generation, agnostic of how that service is actually implemented. Whoops, wrong one. Okay, so that's some uh, slick features there. Other a aspects here in Workflow 4, uh, well, this is still the same, same topic here, Workflow Services. Like I said, in 3.5, it was just the two activities, send and receive. You still have a send and receive here, but they've broken up the reply that goes back into a separate one. So you can uh, put some better intervening logic, more complex logic, such as a whole flowchart in between. Correlation, uh, I'll just you know, state it at a high level. If you haven't done much workflow, it may not be clear what that is. But if you've got a uh, send activity that's going to call out to another workflow, Response comes back in, and then you want to call out to that same workflow at some point later in, the, in that calling workflow. Uh, the hard part there in the past was that you, when you call back out, you need to call to the same running workflow instance. There could be a thousand loan applications in progress. You don't want to just call to whatever one you end up on. You want to call back to the same you know, loan application in progress that this, this conversation represents. So correlation is the ability to correlate an incoming call uh, with a given workflow instance, basically. In the past, to do that was kind of a pain. You had to modify your service operations, put this dictionary of string string on your operations to pass in some correlation context. You had to populate that from the code behind of the workflow. You had to pull it back out on the response. You had to repopulate it on a subsequent call. It was just kind of a mess. Now they have two forms. One is if you need explicit correlation like that, it's much easier a property you saw that you set in the designer. Um, the other thing is it, you don't even need to do that in a lot of cases because they can do what's called content-based correlation. Fairly advanced topic, don't have time to cover it here. Uh, there's some blog posts out there on it. If you just Google, uh, I'm sorry, Bing, I'm in the Microsoft building, I'm surprised the lightning bolt didn't strike me down. Um, just Google you know, WF4 uh, content correlation and you'll find some blog posts on that. Other aspects in Workflow 4, like I mentioned, whole new designer. You saw kind of the experience there. It's, it's evolving. Uh, it, in some ways it's better, some ways it's worse than the old designer. So the right block here is up for debate. Uh, improved designer performance, well, we're still in a beta. It's a little hard to judge that. They claim it is, so I'll believe them. Uh, major rehosting, definitely. Uh, one line of code versus hundred, hundreds of lines of code, that's a big improvement. Unified debugging experience. Uh, you could do some debugging in the designer before where you could set breakpoints and hit them, but you'll, you could only do that if you were in a console 
uh, application or a console project where it was in the same project, put your workflows out in the library, it didn't work anymore. So they have a much better, uh, basically you set breakpoints and the designer can hit them at runtime, look at variables, just like you're in the code basically. So you have a much better uh, debugging experience there. This one here is kind of the driving factor for why did they really need to rewrite everything? You know, how many of you could walk up to your own application and say from version one to version two, I'm gonna get 100 times import, uh, improvement by just refactoring the code? You know, usually you have to do a redesign of some fundamental aspects to do that. Um, and they did that here with the workflow runtime. So there is a whole new runtime. By me you know, uh, measurements they've done, they have achieved that much of a performance increase. And that becomes really important because it expands the number of scenarios where you might be willing to use workflow. One of the most common scenarios people wanted to use workflow before was for something like page flow within a web application. Um, there were really two reasons you wouldn't want to do that in process before. Uh, one was that workflow three used the same thread pool that the ASP.NET runtime does. So Workflow is grabbing all the threads that you want to be responsive to your user. Not a very good idea. So the only solution to that was put it out of process as a service and call it, which meant an even bigger performance hit. Uh, if you put it in, in process and ignored the thread contention there, the use of threads uh, contention, the time to dispatch a call into the workflow to make a simple decision of what page do I show next and then get a response back, you know, it wasn't like minutes or anything, but it was tens of milliseconds, much, much slower than if you just made the d decision in code. With 100 times performance improvement, it gets it down in the range where you might be willing to draw out your navigation scheme in the workflow <laughs> diagram and just use that to decide what page to go to next. And other scenarios obviously can benefit from that. I had a customer that came to me and said, hey, we've got this uh, complicated medical image processing application, <laughs> and one of our biggest problems is the uh, the maintenance nightmare of these algorithms. We have you know, hundreds of little processing steps that for different kinds of analysis, we compose those together in different orders based on conditions and stuff. And trying to maintain the code that composes all these algorithmic steps together is a nightmare. This workflow thing looks really promising to us because we can just drag and drop, hook them up in the right order, visually inspect, and know that we got it right. And I said, yeah, from that perspective, sounds like a perfect fit. Tell me more about your application. They're like, yeah, that maintenance thing, that's one of our biggest problem. But really, our biggest problem is end-to-end -end performance of the algorithm. We cannot drop any in performance on that. So at that point, it was like, OK, forget workflow. Because definitely, you know, the time to call method A, method B, method C in, in code is always going to be a lot faster than workflow. This performance improvement doesn't make it equal, but it gets it much closer to where it might be tolerable to take a small performance hit instead of a major performance hit. Uh, flow in transactions we already talked about. Full control over persistence, what that's talking about. One of the major features of workflow we've had since the beginning is the fact that at a point where a workflow goes idle, instead of just sitting there in memory, consuming memory and resources, you can just flip a switch to turn on persistence and it will write itself out to disk basically as a blob, typically in the database as the built-in provider. And then at the point where it knows it needs to wake up because of either an incoming call, a timer expires, number of criteria like that, the workflow runtime could wake it up, pull it out of persistence, turn it back into a running set of objects and get it going again. Nice feature, good scalability feature. You can span it across multiple servers in a farm, share the backend persistence. So a workflow could run over here, go into sleep mode, you know, when it needs to wake up, get woke up on the server that's least busy kind of thing. So a very nice feature, been there since the start, but you didn't have very fine-grained control over when that persistence happened. And when the persistence happened, it was just a blob in the database. So you had no chance of actually like ad hoc querying what state is that thing in, what's the value of this variable within the uh, workflow. You had to actually load it back into memory and try to query it that way, and even that was cumbersome. So the persistence story's gotten a lot better here as well. Yes? So what happens to a persistent workflow if you change the workflow that persisted and if you read a version of the code? Great question. So the question is, you know, what if you've got these, you know, say you have a six month running workflow and you get some regulatory change, you got to add some new activities, change some other ones, what happens to that persistent workflow? Um, there's another feature we haven't mentioned uh, that hasn't changed a whole lot, but it's still there called dynamic, uh, dynamic something. 
basically dynamic changes to your workflow. There's a standard term for it, but I'm spacing. But basically it means that as a workflow starts up or, or when you reload the workflow from persistence, you have an opportunity to dynamically change its structure uh, before it starts executing. Dynamic update, that's what I was looking for. So with dynamic update, there are events you can hook that says, okay, a workflow is loading, and basically you could inspect uh, based on you know what version information you put in that. You could put uh, attributes on it to identify what version it was. Uh, or there's some that gets written out automatically based on the assembly it's defined in. So you could basically inspect that metadata and say, oh, that was version X. I need to plug in this activity and remove this one and that kind of thing. So you can basically kind of re reshuffle things before it starts executing to get it up to the per previous or up to the current version. Um, in terms of the state that's being read into it, uh, there are better hooks there than there were before for basically, uh, you know, if you have a disconnect between the current activities and the previous activities, typically what you do is you would uh, take the old workflow definition, let it uh, read its state into that one, and then do a dynamic update to it to bring it up to the current uh, version or the current logic that you want up to the point where you can ship a whole new version. And then the persisted workflows at that point, again, there's event hooks and stuff where you can kind of massage the data as needed into the work new workflow structure. It's not easy. I won't say it's easy like any versioning story, but there are the hooks there you need to address the scenarios. Sure. OK, um, you know, uh, last ma major topic here, which doesn't apply to most of you, uh, to a large degree, if you were doing Workflow 3, maybe you have colleagues that are using it or know people, let them know that you know they're not <coughs> completely being left out in the cold in terms of migration. Like I said, their existing workflows aren't going to break on Workflow 4. The entire stack that's there now is also shipping in Workflow 4, so they will just run. But in terms of migrating, any custom activity you have now, you just plug it into a Workflow 4 workflow with a wrapper, basically this thing called an interop, interop activity. Um, the uh, other thing you can do to kind of prepare yourself is stop writing code behind because the code behind doesn't migrate, migrate at all in this new XAML only world. So you have to find ways to stop using code activities was one of the main places you had code behind and try to avoid handling events. Uh, try to find some other way to get it done. There's a whole section out on MSDN that has various white papers on migration scenarios, including <coughs> what do you do for the one thing they did leave you out in the cold on, such as state machine workflows. Resources, almost nothing at this point. That's one of the hard things is that uh, there's a few very high level descriptions, kind of like this is a high level talk, but you know, deep in-depth scenarios with workflow four, just partly because the betas have been you know, not very complete themselves. Uh, not a lot out there to point you to, but that should be evolving in the near future since, since this one's getting a lot more functional than beta one was. That's all I have on workflow. Before you go, I've got a task for you. Go to tv.ssw.com and subscribe to our newsletter. You'll be informed of all upcoming videos. In addition, if you're super keen, I'm all about inspecting and adapting. So send me an email or send me a tweet at Adam Kogan. Cheers.